I was firing my weapon down range and I turned my head to shout to a guy across from me to tell him to move. And as I did, as I turned my head, I squeezed off a round. So although my weapon was pointing down range and technically it's safe, that's still a safety violation because my eye was not through the rifle sight. And you can get two of those violations um, on selection and then you're off. I was kind of going over this in my head. And I realized in that moment that I'd been putting so much pressure on myself to be perfect and sort of concentrating on the end result of passing or failing that I was actually performing worse. You know, that mistake that I'd made, I'd never made that in my entire career beforehand. And I realized that I just needed to let go of that because I had no control. Obsessing over the end result was not helping me. And actually all I needed to do was concentrate on each day or each moment and just be the best I could, put all my effort into that and the result would take care of itself. Simon, how are you doing? Pleasure to be on here. Thanks for having me on, Fergus. No, not at all. Look forward to chatting things through. So, first of all, let's dive straight in. What moment of your military career rewired your current mindset the most? Oh, that's an interesting. I've never. That is a very good question. I will tell you one that stands out as an epiphany moment, which I've shared before, and I think has got a tangible takeaway from it, and that is. I so you know brief background I was Royal Marines and then I went on selection for special forces so selection process six months um, it's the same SBS SAS it's the same selection process everyone knows about kind of you know walking around Wales with a heavy weight on your back um, and there's lessons within that we can dig into afterwards but after that phase you have two weeks where you essentially do some work on the ranges to get familiar with the, the the weapons you're going to be using, the rifles, and then you deploy to the jungle. On that two-week phase in between, on one of those um, range exercises, what you're predominantly doing is what we call break contact drills. So scenario is you're a small patrol, and as you're patrolling, enemy contacts you, um, ambushes you, and you have to extract out of that position um, using kind of cover and maneuver. Yeah, good example, watch the film Heat. That's probably got the best, one of the best scenes in that for it. So during that, I was firing my weapon rifle down range and I turned my head to shout to a guy across from me to tell him to move. And as I did, as I turned my head, I squeezed off a round. So although my weapon was pointing down range and technically it's safe, that's still a safety violation because my I was not through the rifle sight. And you can get two of those violations um, on selection and then you're off. So that was basically my one life gone. And you kind of go and you to the head instructor and it just gives you the, you know, you've had this warning and so you're officially notified. And as I was leaving his office and I was walking back over to the accommodation, I was kind of going over this in my head. And I realized in that moment that I'd been putting so much pressure on myself to be perfect and sort of concentrating on the end result of passing or failing that I was actually performing worse. You know, that mistake that I'd made, I'd never made that in my entire career beforehand, but it was almost this this pressure. I'd, I'd taken myself past optimum performance to it having a detrimental effect. And I realized that I just needed to let go of that because I had no control, obsessing over the end result was not helping me. And actually all I needed to do was concentrate on each day or each moment and just be the best I could, put all my effort into that and the result would take care of itself. At the end of it, I was either going to be good enough or not. And I just let go of that pressure and it was almost like a physical weight lifting. And from that point onwards, A, the experience was a much more positive one. It was more, I say enjoyable loosely, like it's obviously not a very enjoyable experience selection, but also it made it much more likely to get the result that I wanted, which was to pass, and that was the result I ended up with. So that releasing of that pressure to be perfect made a huge difference. And it's something that I see a lot with the coaching that we do. We see one of the most common sort of behavior cycles that we see, what we call boom and bust, and that is, Someone decides they want to make a change. So a pain point gets acute enough that they want to change something. You know, health and fitness is the, is the classic one, losing weight or getting fitter. And so they decide, right, that's it. I'm going to follow, I'm going to get this perfect training plan or this perfect diet. And in eight weeks, I'm going to weigh this much or I'm going to be able to run this fast, whatever it is. 
and they follow that plan perfectly for a week maybe, maybe two weeks, and then they get a last minute deadline from work or their kid gets sick or whatever it is and they miss a meal or they miss a training session. And so the next time that they're due to take an action, that thought process creeps in of, ah, oh, you've already spoiled the perfect run, so that means you're not gonna get that perfect result, so what's the point? And so you then miss the next one and the next one. And you basically just throw it all out the window. You fall into an all or nothing mindset, you bend the whole thing and you're back at square one. And people just live in these boom bust cycles of trying to make these big perfect changes and they're rebounding back to where they are. As opposed to the, the ethos that we embed with everyone we work with is something we call moving average. And the moving average is the idea that you do not need perfection to make progress. All you need is consistency. Like everyone has bad days, everyone misses workouts and training sessions. But if you switch from that all or nothing mindset to, okay, I can't do an hour workout, but I can do a 15 minute walk. Well, that still ties into my moving average. And all you need is your moving average to just, just be in the positive, just always edging into the positive. And if you do that and get rid of this timeline obsession as well and see it as a lifestyle change and becoming that type of person as opposed to just getting an end result, it's game changing. When, when people make that shift, the results they get are so much easier to achieve. And they, ironically, they get them far quicker as well. What's fascinating there is you have succinctly described one of the key messages that I often put across when I'm describing my own journey with my mental health because what ultimately sent me into a spiral of depression that ultimately led to a suicide attempt was that rigidity no longer serving me and actually becoming paralysis. So my lack of adaptability to the things going on around me out with the arbitrary plan that I'd roadmapped out in my own head meant that as soon as I was deviating away from that plan in any direction in the pursuit of the perfect plan, meant that I could label myself a failure. Whereas even when I was taking one step forward, I wouldn't label myself a success. So it was a complete negative feedback loop that I had going on inside my own head. And ultimately now the way I live my life is I very much structure and plan things and apply rigidity to the structures in my life that acknowledge the adaptability, the variability of the things we can't predict, like a global pandemic, for example, or an incoming or already existing recession, for example, all these things that get chucked at us. It's just so fascinating to hear from your perspective, that's something that's common, because it almost makes me feel more certain of the changes I've made in my own life now, having reflected upon my previously ne negative experiences where rigidity was ultimately what led my depression to spiral. And now adaptability and an open mind to how I move forward rather than purely sticking to the plan serves me much better. A phrase that I often use is that you create the plan, you control the plan, the plan doesn't control you. And that's something I always remind myself of whenever it goes to mapping things out because they can change. So from a personal point of view, it's great to hear that it almost reinforces the decision I've made. So great. For a selfish reason, selfish point of view, this yeah. podcast has been a great success. We'll call it there, mate. Very good, very good. It's, um, the, the other thing that you just mentioned there that also ties into moving average. Um, so it's A, process, not end result. But it's also within that like growth mindset. So something else you kind of mentioned of giving yourself this arbitrary because this is all they are. Like Goals are just arbitrary things that we set for ourselves. They're, they're just measures that we're controlling what we say they are and also what we link them to and if you're linking the result to your self-worth and then suddenly you're not getting that exact result in that exact time frame or whatever it is you're always losing basically you're always going to lose if you link the result to your self-worth you're always going to lose and it's a an indictment or an indictment of a fixed mindset which basically says um you you have finite qualities i.e like your intelligence your fitness and all the rest of it and the results that you get are a representation of it as opposed to growth mindset which is really you've got no idea what your potential is unless you put in maximum effort you know for example you and i the one that i use a lot you, know, you and i today could say right we're going to practice chess every day eight hours a day for an entire year well, who knows how good we could be if we did that. Like, obviously, we're not going to do it, but it's just the point stands. Everyone says, oh, I'm no good at this or no good at that. And it's like, well, just stop for a moment. Imagine if you spent every single hour you had spare of every day on it for like one, two, three years. 
How do you know how good you're going to get? And it's not that you're going to do that, but it's every time you say that, you're just reinforcing to yourself that you have fixed traits around something as opposed to everything to a degree can be approved upon. Like, you know, you and I are not going to play in the NBA. However, again, we've got no idea how good at basketball we could get. A very good sort of example to illustrate fixed and growth mindset, which usually resonates with a lot of people. And it's got a good lesson in it as to how we speak to our, to kids as well. Um, so Carol Dweck is kind of the proponent or came up with fixed and growth mindsets. Took two groups of school children. They were given puzzles to complete and one group was praised for effort so how hard they tried and one group was praised for the result they got and how intelligent they were oh you know you're very clever you've done this you must be very smart to get that result they then gave them progressively harder puzzles and the group that were praised for intelligence for the results gave up much sooner and the reason they gave up was one if you if you've been told you're a certain amount of in, you have a certain amount of intelligence then once something becomes difficult, well, what's the point in putting more effort in? Because to you, you've hit your ceiling. And also, if you're linking your self-worth to the result, to the praise you get, well, you don't want to lose that. So you don't want to fail at things. Whereas when you have the growth mindset, you know that it's your growth. Like it's the effort that you're putting in. And so it just becomes a challenge and it becomes enjoyable to keep trying. And failure becomes just a part of the route to success which is what it is like when you're in a fixed mindset it's very easy to look at things and size them up and and see success and failure as two separate routes so you either succeed or you fail one's good one's bad as opposed to everything in life success and failure are inextricably linked like you can't have one without the other and it's just a process and that's why for me like moving average is my pretty much go-to mantra whenever I feel like if I feel overwhelmed coming on, if I feel stress coming on, if I feel like something's going wrong, I just come back to moving average. It's just part of the process. Business, process, it's all process. My fitness is just process. Relationships, it's process, it's not fixed. I need to have difficult conversations if I wanna move forward. It's just everything is process. And the more you come back to that, as opposed to obsessing over results, honestly, it just removes so much stress because you're like, well, it's just life. Life is a process and it's just, it's ongoing. There is no finish line. You're never going to finish being fit and healthy. You're never going to finish your mindset. Like work, you're always going to have, there's always going to be something else to do. And so if you're always trying to get to this point, some undefined point in the future where you're like, oh, if, if I can just, if I can just weigh this much, if I can just get this salary, if I can just buy this house, if you're thinking like that about anything, you're basically offsetting your happiness and satisfaction and you're setting yourself up to make life a lot harder than it needs to be. I view growth mindsets as almost action and curiosity is the way I've always understood it because we all have these things, oh, I think I might give that a go. Oh, that's interesting. How does somebody do that? How could I maybe work up to that? physical challenge or they make side money and property i wonder how somebody could do that is actually taking the action on that and rewiring that i'm stuck in the way that i'm doing things however recently i've become a little bit more cynical about my own growth mindset as it has actually started to weigh me down and stop me from being present because i feel as if i've been somewhat rewired to be unable to switch off so for context for those listening that might not be aware and for yourself, is that I'm currently training for a double extreme triathlon, a double Ironman distance extreme triathlon, which means that my training volume has gone through the roof, which means fatigue's through the roof, but we're also in a a positively challenging period of time for both businesses, which means that I'm burning the candle very aggressively at both ends. I do things that I enjoy on a day-to-day basis. However, I'm doing them every waking minute of every day, which means that somewhere along the way recently, I've lost the ability to be present in the downtime that I try and work in. And the examples I give where I've realized this is a problem and it's become something I need to fix is I did a whiskey tour with some friends that I had up from down south and I caught myself taking a calculator out and doing maths on how many people there were in the room, how much they paid for the tour, how many tours they did every weekend and then aggregated how many tours I estimate they do across the week so I could just in my head calculate the rough turnover that they make annually just because I was curious. 
And I thought, well, what the fuck are you doing? You're meant to be spending time with your friends and enjoying this whiskey tour, but here you are trying to put it in this commercial framework. And then similarly, I caught myself planning and thinking about my next training session when I'd left my phone at home and I was out walking the dogs with Erin. We'd specifically left phones, said, this is the time we're going to go and walk the dogs and we're just going to sort of enjoy doing nothing. And I caught myself flitting to these thoughts that I almost couldn't stop myself from thinking. And I got really, really frustrated because I was like, well, why have you lost the ability to to control this? And I think it's just because I've lost that framework of building in the downtime. And I know it's something that you, you, you talk about frequently. So let's play devil's advocate. I think a growth mindset can be a negative thing. How would you respond to that as a concept? And what would be the recommendations you'd make to manage a growth mindset from a consistent point of view so that it doesn't get to the stage that I've just referenced? I, I mean, just listening to that, I would argue that a growth mindset isn't the issue there. Like, a, you know, growth mindset is essentially just our perspective on how we're seeing a challenge or problem. I would say perhaps what is going on is more the fact, like you said, you cannot do everything at once. So it's like James Clear's four burners theory. Like you, you can't, if you ever want to reach your potential in any area, you've got to downplay the burners in the other. So, and especially I've found with business for, for the last five years, and it's only started to change this year. Like, so for the, say for the first four years of it, I could not have any other burners even up to halfway. Like everything was getting t &E, the business, that working point. So my health and fitness has basically just ticked over since I left the military because all of my energy and focus was on the business. And there's no way I could have done some big chat or something else alongside it that took up, that took me away from it because it just required all that time and effort. And so like if you're, you're, you've got two huge things you're, you're doing at the moment well not only that three because it's not just one business you've got two like one is hard enough you've got two sides of the business and you try to think of all the systems and processes and getting that on point and a massive training volume for the for the body which is also putting you under fatigue don't forget that like you when we put ourselves if you're putting your you're stressing that sympathetic nervous system constantly you're going to pay for that in your mental, like your mental thought processes and how you see things. And it can be almost more like, you know, that thing with a calculator can almost be more like an escapism rather than, it's almost like sometimes with that downtime and I've had it before when I was in the business thing, when, when things aren't where you want it to be, you can almost avoid conversations. Like I can remember being with friends I'm like, just don't fucking talk to me about the business. I don't want to talk about it. Yeah, it's all fine. And it's almost like all you want to do is go and work on that until it's at a point where you feel like it's level and you're like, oh, okay, now I can, I can not think about that for a bit. So sometimes I feel it, it may be, and I, I've experienced it before, if you feel like space, plates are spinning but and they're not where you want them to be, it can be very, very hard to switch off from it. Now, conversely, I do find that like, when you are passionate about something, so when I was in the military and same with t and &E now, like I still think about t and &E all the time, but it's as the business has kind of got to a point where the financial stress has lessened, so it's not every month where can we pay ourselves and it's kind of settled down and on point. It's just a pleasurable, oh, that's a good idea for a post. That's a good idea for a content. And when I feel like that overwhelm coming on of, oh, I've still got all these things to do. I just come back to, and John and I have this conversation all the time. It's like, well, that's just our job now. There's always going to be something to do. And as John said a couple of days ago, if we're not thinking like that, well, we're stagnating and dying. So it's not a bad thing, but we just remove not letting that become stress. So I don't know with what you're saying. I don't know if it's necessarily growth mindset as opposed to you're trying to do some massive things that's taking up so much of your time cognitively and you're putting huge physical stress on the body, like that's gonna have repercussions. Whether you kind of realize it or not, I, you know, I definitely find when I'm under huge fatigue, my mood, I'd like, it's just not right. And my mental clarity isn't right. And I, I don't process things as well. I find it hard to switch off and relax. And I see this in the people we coach, like 
professionals that are in big investment firms or high pressure jobs find it very hard because they're putting so much under so much pressure and stress and they don't have the good habits around it it's very hard to switch off almost with you because i imagine like you are aware of all the habits around circadian rhythm all this kind of stuff but because you're doing so much on the physical side it's almost going to be very hard for those to take place because you just put so much cognitive and physical stress on your body so I, I, just I like actually, an opinion no 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 that's, that's what i was interested to hear and it, i just want to align it with the reflections i've had recently not from us sort of wanting to make this conversation about my uh, i'm not stealing your your billable time <laughs> as it were good. but <laughs> it's a case of the reflect i'll record a podcast on this after i've got through that triathlon because i've, I've made a series of mistakes I, i've reflected upon the decisions i've made and i've fallen into a trap where my growth mindset has allowed me to work myself to a point blind because I enjoy the things that I do to a point where I've kind of redefined my baseline in my head. And again, that rigidity that I mentioned beforehand meant that if I took a step backwards from that baseline, I'm no, the moving average is no longer in the black. It's no longer moving forward. It's going backwards, which for me is always something I've struggled with. But recently I've realized yeah. it, the, the, rea the reality is I've simply taken on too much and that's that's fine that's very human that's something that i've assessed i've looked at things from the yeah. top down and i've created some solutions but it was strange to me that i found it so confusing to come to that realization even with the self-awareness that i have from the experience that i've had the conversations like this one that i've had and the people i've spoken to professionally over the years i found it fascinating that because i was enjoying the things that i was doing i couldn't see past the fact that it was just in reality too much but i think it was a growth mindset that got me there but then it was my own mistakes that are completely separate that uh, allowed it to exacerbate to the point that i am now so i do agree it's not growth mindset led but it's it's something to be conscious of if we are passionate about things is that we can wear ourselves thin through passion as much as we can a lack of passion also i'd say as much as we sometimes all hate to admit it because it does play in it's very easy especially when we do enjoy something to let the ego take in as well as oh, I can do all this I can you know I can do the business side and can smash whatever it is and it is as much as we have self-awareness it, it, you know it's the classic it's very easy for us to see our friends problems and then it's much harder for us to see it our own you know it, often within the coaching that I do when I'm working through things with people the answers are quite obvious only because they have been doing this a while but also like sometimes they are just it, it's very simple and it just needs that person to hear it from an outside perspective and when you say it they're like ah oh, yeah that does make sense oh, and it's almost just that moment of clarity for them but it's it's not rocket science it's it's, it's hand just being able in to many see ways, isn't it it, it's it's helping yeah. it's holding the person's hand as you guide them to the conclusion that they get to themselves you're you're not you're not giving them the the answers to the math problem you're sitting there and and helping them work their way through it is the way i always view things and uh yeah i think that's why especially as blokes given that you mentioned the the e word the ego word we we do better problem solving together when this sort of conversation comes up because it allows us to let that ego settle it allows us to look at things for what they are and then it allows the outside perspectives to recalibrate on what the reality and the neutral objective situation in front of you actually is so that you can come to realistic conclusions take action move forwards rinse and repeat keep going until uh ultimately we hopefully die happy and, and not, <laughs> not hungry well, I, just, I think it's just understanding ourselves as well so much of it is getting that really clear and that's a lot of the work that we do is helping people to really understand themselves so how do they see themselves how do they see the world and how is that affecting their thoughts and behaviors and then it's within that okay how do you want to be like who's the person you actually want to be and how do you want to live right let's start to make some consistent changes around this so it is that that true understanding of self and for that you just need to be in a place and the, the key with any kind of mindset work is honesty like until you're really willing to be honest with yourself to look at all oh, right yeah maybe that is ego i am doing this because of recognition and not just because i'm passionate about it or whatever it is that's when you can start to make the change uh, the thing is the more you try and hide from yourself 
you're going to pay for it anyway. Like there's repercussions. You, those deeper narratives are going to play out in symptoms, usually in a negative way, even if you are trying to hide from them and not look at them. Whereas at least when you shine a light on it, you can be like, ah, okay, this is now I can see why I act like this in this situation or why I act out in certain ways. You know, an analogy I always use, which we've kind of all been there to explain or just to kind of illustrate that it's usually never the surface level thing event that's triggering us it's it's our beliefs behind it it's you know your your partner your husband wife girlfriend boyfriend asks you to clean something up or tidy up and what they're asking is can you tidy up but what we hear is are you saying i'm messy are you saying i'm lazy like that's what we're hearing and that's what we react to and makes us trigger as opposed to oh yeah sure no problem i left that out i'll i'll clean it up and it's the same, you know, when we read that email, when whatever it is, if you just take that moment to stop and it's something, a practice I've sort of ingrained into myself as a habit, when I feel myself getting like overly frustrated by something, annoyed by something, basically being overly triggered in an emotional or sense or in a thought cycle, I've just learned to stop and just ask myself, why? Like, why is this really frustrating yourself? Why are you getting so pissed off? Why is this annoying you so much? And just try and step back from it. Just have that gap be between the stimulus and response and just look at like, why are you re why is this really frustrating you so much? Because, you know, it's just a thing, whatever it is, an email. And usually when you do that, you can kind of get to understand what's really beneath it and what's triggering it. And then when you have that, it's much easier to make changes and start moving forward and, and move away from those negative thought and behavior patterns. On that, and obviously with the, the skills and the self-awareness that you've developed and you're reciting at this point, that comes from a long experience, well, a long range of experiences in the military in your personal life. And let's just rewind quickly with some context first of all just on the timeline around your military career and then more importantly a question i ask any operational or ex-operational guest that we have on the podcast is how did you adjust to civilian life afterwards and then we'll move on to exactly how your self-awareness developed from one operational role into a civilian one and ultimately how we got here today so uh Join the so Royal, join the Royal Marines first. I didn't join until I was twenty four, so I'd done a college, university, and some travelling beforehand. Joined the Royal Marines, and then uh, joined Special Forces for the SBS. I did three tours of Afghan in total. Did just under eight years, and then decided I, I basically ticked off everything that I wanted to do in the military. Was looking for sort of what's next. I wanted to leave when I was in my early thirties, so that I could. Uh, you know essentially have another career or do something else I was also kind of looking for that new challenge left and my partner at the time my missus at the time got a, had a job in London so I was like well look, I'm not really sure what I want to do maybe I'll try you yeah, know that kind of life and I got a job in a management consultancy and realized very quickly that it just wasn't for me and it, like that disalignment between or misalignment between myself and kind of that life for the first time ever went through feeling stress, you know, lacking consistency in my training, um, seeing repercussions in my relationship, basically just like just not being happy and satisfied. And what do, that what, what do you think it was? What, what do you think the real the disconnect misalignment, was? Like a com just a disconnect between my values and how, who I was and how I wanted to live and the job I was doing, like being a management consultant in London, getting on the tube each day is like that. It's just, just wasn't me. Whereas, there was people in that office, you know, very good at the job, who loved it. And, and this is a, a kind of a good wider point. You know, they loved that. I didn't, so I felt the effect. But then to them, the military, you know, looked terrible, like, you know, really hard, you're cold, wet, and doing all this stuff. Whereas for me, that's easy. Like, military career was easy. Yeah, you did hard stuff, but because it completely aligned with who I was, it was easy. You know, look at what you do, you know, training for this Ironman you're passionate about it. So although it's very hard, it's also, it's not stressful hard. It's, it's, it's a hard, but that aligns with you. It ticks your boxes. Whereas for other people, like that's the hell on earth, the training that you're doing. So this comes back to the point of 
when we're, we're in life, you're really looking to find you, more you can understand who you are and align the actions you take in life with that, the easier life becomes. It's, you, know, you know, people talk about NIMS um, who I serve with in the military, you know, climbing the 14 peaks, and they're like, you know, how can I be more like NIMS? And like, you must be so motivated and to do all that hard stuff. It's like, no, that's, what NIMS is doing is easy for NIMS. Not in the sense, like I said, it is hard, but it's easy for him to take to make all those sacrifices and take it because it just aligns. He loves what he does. He aligns with what he's doing. And like so, it's finding that fit as much as you can in life. Um, you know, military easy for me, stress free, happy. London, well paid job, prestigious, not happy, stressed. Like long story short, that put me on the path to wanting to start a business. The first one that John and I. Um, and my business partner did massive failure spent all of our savings I at the same time my relationship five year relationship ended so John and I ended up living both living back at my parents um, little farm in Worcester we shared a car that cost 400 quid between us and we were paying ourselves less than that a month but at that point we started t &E, which we were passionate about and again suddenly happy on the right path so it's like military hard but easy, London well paid, look great from the outside, not happy, living back at home in your mid 30s broke, happy again because it aligned. So it's this point that like, if you're always looking for external factors for your happiness and satisfaction, you're always going to be disappointed. You have to understand who you are, what your values are and then start taking actions in alignment with that. And that doesn't mean you have to change your career overnight or anything. For some people, it's as simple as just adding in a hobby that they're passionate about and having that interest or whatever it is outside of work. But it is a really key part of finding that fulfillment. Basically, when you interact with the world, that's what elicits your thoughts and your emotions. And that's driven by your identity and how you see yourself. The more you interact with the world, in a way that aligns with your ideal self, the more happiness you experience. The more you don't do that, the more anger, frustration, sadness, negative emotions you're gonna feel. That comes with work, however. And I think in this day and age, there's a bit of a disconnect between the reps required, shall we say. So when you say physical training, people will immediately think, all right, three sets of 12, go to the gym, I'll do my three sets of 12. They know exactly what to do. They know the prescriptive general approach they need to take they know that if they go and they do it they will get from a to b whereas when it comes to developing a mindset developing a resilience developing that self-awareness i think there's a bit of a misconception that just absorbing the information or acknowledging the information or trying to scratch the surface with it without actually practicing or doing the reps will get you there but i'm not sure whether that's a almost a resilience to doing the reps or an ignorance that the reps are required, if you know what I mean. So from your perspective yeah. with the people you've worked with, from the perception you have of the current state of how people approach things in, in mindset terms, what do people do wrong? Where do people go wrong in terms of how they approach the considerations they have on a day-to-day -day basis about who they are, the direction they're going in, and where they want to be? Yeah, perfect, perfect question. And that is... That's essentially our overall ethos, that mindset is a skill set and where most people go wrong is they do not treat it like that. So it's no different exactly what you said with a physical body. You can't listen to a podcast, watch a YouTube video, read a book and expect your physical body to change. Like, Of course you can't. Like, no one expects that. And yet that's exactly what we do with mindset. We will listen to a podcast, maybe read a book, maybe try a bit of meditation now and again. And we think that that is going to rewire decades of neural pathways and behavior patterns. Never going to happen. You need consistent active practice. Um, you know, we, we actually got, we've probably got a percentage of people that go through our course who have either been through some form of therapy or are going through it concurrently. And, and even with that, the, most, the common thing I hear is it's very helpful having that session, but then... I've got nothing to do outside of it. I still don't feel like I'm moving forwards. Essentially, what we've done and the reason we created our program is we kind of took five years of our coaching, all the books, all the research, all the learning that we've done around neuroscience, psychology, and 
deconstructed that into an actual step-by-step -step process so people have daily actions that they take and so you, if you want an example of the reps like you said that, that you need to put in let's say for example you have a certain belief around um, like a, a negative thought pattern that comes up for you you worry about something or you know whenever you get an email from a certain person or something happens and it, it triggers this this thought pattern or a worry pattern and that obviously has negative effects for you so a practice will essentially be one when that starts to happen you need to learn to catch yourself so rather than it happening and you automatically go into that pattern and you start to react to it you start practicing stopping and stepping back so giving you that gap between that stimulus and response bringing awareness to it so you know a good question to ask is okay what's the belief here and what's the truth so what's the belief that i have that's driving this and usually there's something there the way that you're seeing it versus you know what's the truth what's what's actually happening what's the actual event and just because i've had this in the past not letting that belief color what's happening now so it's bringing some real world perspective to it and then putting in a strategy to counter that maybe it is like a moving average mantra it's like okay let's take this back to it's just process i'll move through it or, or what there's so many different strategies we can use but essentially the formula being widen that gap between stimulus and response bring awareness to it bring some context to how your belief may be coloring it what you're actually seeing not the surface level and then bringing perspective and putting in a strategy to counter that pattern so you're actively changing it that's a rep like so every time you do that you're starting to rewire that old default pattern which was to go straight into that worry thought process or getting angry or getting frustrated whatever it is and as with any skill learning sometimes when you do it it'll work and sometimes it won't sometimes you'll still default to that old pattern because don't forget that's been wired for years and years and years it's not going to change overnight but the more you practice this the more you'll start to change that default to the one you actually want it to be. And so if you consistently are doing this, bringing awareness, putting your strategies in, that's when you'll start to see changes. But you need to do those reps. Like You're never going to change those years of behavior patterns and thought patterns without processes like this. And it needs to be done consistently. And it doesn't have to be. Once you start doing it, it's actually quite easy. Like We teach this in a very manageable step-by-step -step process and again apply moving average to it to take the pressure off like you don't need to get it perfect every time but each time you attempt it a oh, brilliant you're starting to put those changes in place and people do see like it's surprising how quickly even within a few weeks people start to see and what we see a lot of the time is family members or colleagues will start to notice changes in people because they're they're not react they're suddenly not reacting all the time they're much calmer, they're much more collective, and they're starting to become that person they want to be. It goes back to the, uh, the, the mantra that I often try and remind myself of whenever I need to take that, that step back and abandon the emotional subjectivity in place of objective reality, I guess, which is easy choices, hard life, hard life, easy, sorry, hard, hard choices, easy life. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna repeat that part just so it's, it's more succinct. <laughs> easy choices, hard life, hard choices, easy life. And it's the same message that runs through the thread of DNA that goes with all of the in vogue mindset leveling up tools, ice water, cold water therapy. It's a hard decision. Getting in is not something we want to do instinctively. Once you're in, oh, it's really cold. Then you're fighting with that self-talk you're presented with. And it's a constant hard choice. If you're doing that over and over and over again, then that will allow you to better process hard choices, which means that your life will become easier because hard things affect you less. So with that in mind, given the experiences you had, the people you've spoken with and the things that you've seen work most effectively, what are the tools in general terms that you think the average person, those listening, can implement in their day-to-day -day lives to level up their mindset? If there are any, of course there we take the approach a, a dual approach essentially in the sense that the some internal work so some form of bringing awareness to yourself and your thoughts a very good one for that 
is some form of journaling practice. Again, journaling is either often misused or just written off as a bit kind of like woo woo or out there. It's actually one of the most, it's one of the easiest and most effective ways to really understand yourself and what's going on. But I find the best way to use it is to use specific questions. So to set yourself, and I mean, there's lots of books out there that you can get that do this for you or just set yourself specific questions around like either events that are happening. So if something is a particular event at work or whatever, just pose the question to yourself. Why is this causing me to react in X way or you know this way, whatever that is? Or simple things like, how do I see success? How do I see myself? Um, anything that's happened particularly in your life or areas of your life you want to dig into, like why do I always react this way in relationships? Why do I always respond this way? And just really try and dig into and go as deep as possible. And the easiest way to do that is just keep asking yourself why. So whatever you write down initially, just say, well, why? Why do I think this? Why do I, why have I written that? Keep asking why and you'll learn or you'll, and again, it's a practice, it's a skill in yourself. You'll start getting down to the real core of what's driving things. The key part of that process is, A, you've got to be willing to be honest and you've got to actually be willing to look at those parts of yourself that you might not necessarily like, which we all have. But seeing that as something positive, because once you know it, then you can start to change it. So that is a very simple, like 10 minutes of that every day. If you did 10, 15 minutes of that directed journaling every day, I guarantee you will see a change within even a couple of weeks, like no doubt. And then on the other side, the external simple changes or implementing simple habits, which again are overlooked. Things like don't look at your phone for the first 36 minutes, 30 to 60 minutes of the day. Instead, do a morning walk, get some morning light, do some exercise, or just simply be present with your family, whoever's around. But not letting your phone kind of hijack your mind straight away because you'll be looking at emails or social media or whatever it is. So something as simple as that. Same at the other end of the day. Just putting the screens away, putting the phone away, you know, one to two hours before you go to bed. Just those two things for most people. Like most people wake up, first thing they do is on their phone and they're doing it last thing before bed. If you just implemented that, like first last 60, 60 minutes at the beginning of the day, 60 minutes at the end of the day, and a 10 minute internal reflective practice, you will see results. But those things that I've just said there, they're not sexy. It's not the big, uh, take this supplement, you'll see this change or you know some dramatic effect. But from what I've seen and all the work that we've done and the more I read about or spend time with high performers, that's the difference. The, the people who are really fulfilling their potential and finding happiness and contentment along the way are the people who are doing these simple daily practices. There's nothing crazy, it's not rocket science, but they're just either overlooked or people are just too sold down that kind of big shiny object, um, which we get sold on all the time on social media. It's difficult to feel a tangible output from those things as well, which I think puts a lot of people off. And it goes back to something I've heard you talk about before. And interestingly, I spoke about with Mike Chadwick last week ex-paratrooper and it's the external validation that we all need as human beings from when we're doing things that we're a proud of or b find difficult and not receiving the feedback that we want or crave and then that stopping us from moving forwards even if the thing is something we're passionate about so i know in the jungle as part of sf selection you don't get much feedback at all if any from the ds do you and that often breaks yeah. a lot of the applicants because they aren't sure where they are in the pecking order. And as with selection, you don't really know how you're getting on because it's not if you're in the first 50, you'll be fine. It's where are you with the pack? What's the the parameters are always moving, aren't they? So it means that people are in the dark and need to keep moving forwards without knowing that they're doing a good job. And I think that feeds into why habits can seem not very sexy to people, people because there's nobody giving you a pat on the back for ignoring your phone for the last 60 minutes. It's, it's kind of you versus you in that sense. And you, you, you need to try and implement these things over time so that you're just constantly moving forward. So how did you respond to not having that validation from the directing staff? And do you have any other examples of guys you were with or anything you witnessed that didn't allow them to continue where the external validation was what they really needed to be able to actually move forwards? This, um, this directly ties back again to 
process and your ideal self. And this is the change we see all the people on our course. As they go through it, they get much better at, A, just, when you really tr- love the process, you like the result does become less and less important, but also your ability to self-validate becomes much easier. And that is so powerful when you're not looking for that external feedback. So with the jungle, you, you're absolutely right. You, you basically hardly get any feedback. And the jungle is such a hard environment to soldier in that you make mistakes all the time. And the DS is just there and they're making notes of their pad. You know, I'll give you an example. We our patrol, like everything is just hard work. We had to, we were filling up our water before we had to go meet our DS. We were doing a, a patrol navex or something that day. And we were in a bit of a rush anyway to make the timing and all of the patrol were over the other so there was a river um and a big like fallen tree with a with some rope across it to get across the other side and six of the patrol were over that side and myself and one other were getting the water and it's down on this like kind of muddy bank and we're filling up the water bottles and then we were like coming back up the bank and I slipped a bit and I only found this out afterwards but one of the other guys in the patrol said to me I was like oh Jeff's having a bad day isn't he because I just slipped he's like it'll probably fall off the bridge next oh, well, sure enough what happened so I was going across this this log bridge and slipped and I fell I grabbed the rope and I fell and I was like because you've got a massive bergen on your back so that weight and I was literally imagine at 90 degree like perpendicular to the log just holding onto the rope and I was like well fucking hell, I just got to let go. There's nothing else I can do. So I let go, dropped like five feet, luckily onto the bank, not the river. But then like my weapon was covered in mud. I was covered in mud. So then got back up, got over, raced. You know, we got there, got to the DS. What's the first thing he says? Right, strip your weapon, show them to me because they're expected to be clean all the time. And there's nothing you can do. You just have to like hand your weapon over covered in mud. And so things like that kind of happen all the time. And if you let that get into your head, if I'd let that, get into my head and be like, oh, you failed because, you know, that's obviously a big black mark. But because I was, A, I'd had that moment before I'd taken the pressure off, but B, you know, this was all I wanted to do. This was, there was no way I was going to come off that course unless I was taken off or medically taken off. Like, no, I was going to stay there to the end. How would you have felt best each day? If you'd handed your weapon over covered in mud and he said, that's you, done, you're off home, mate. What would, how would you have felt? Would you have been happy with the effort you'd put in and accepted the mistake was the mistake? Or would you have been wrestling with yourself that you could have done things differently? I would, up until that point, well, I mean, I've got it so long ago now, like, obviously, you'd be massively disappointed. Like, for me, I just would have put myself straight back on. So you, I, especially with the tools now, I, you know, it's quite hard retrospectively to think about it, but you have to hindsight you know is a wonderful tool and we can always think oh did we do this or did did we do that and it's good to identify the mistakes but you have to and this is something you do in the kind of the military you have to look at at that time did you make the best decisions you could have with the information you had or take the actions that you had and it it kind of comes in so i'll answer your question in a bit of a roundabout way because it was something i was going to come on to so when i finished the jungle you don't know if you've passed until you go back to Hereford. So you've got a few days like decompression stuff and then you fly back and then you're told. But when you actually finish, because you, you're under the canopy, under the trees for four weeks, like f- pretty much tactical the whole time. And then you get a helicopter out back out to the army battle camp out there where you're kind of staying until you leave. And they hand you a beer when the index is called and you're on that helicopter. And I remember sitting on that helicopter flying over the canopy and that was my most sat- that was more satisfying than even passing like getting my berry and stuff at the end because in that moment even though i didn't know if i'd passed i knew that i'd done all that i could and so whatever the result was i was like i couldn't have done any more and that like moment of self kind of validation that meant more to me i was like, you're like you know you did it because it is you can't explain the trees to people like the, the point in Brecken marching around with the, the weight on your back, that's not selection. That's just to get your plane ticket. Like, it is difficult. It's boring and it's shit. And it is physically taxing to a degree. But it's not like if you find that hard, then good luck in the jungle because it's, it's really not. Like, the jungle is just a whole other level 
of physical and mental hardship where you, like you're just on the edge of what you're capable of every single day like it just really tests you and so for me getting through that and getting to the end of it I was like you know you did good there it was a good effort and that kind of self-satisfaction and I think it is somewhat personality driven as in ever since I was a kid like I never needed or expected my parents or anyone to come to a football match or I think like I just never need I was always I think I naturally had that to a degree of I know when I've put in the effort and if I'm happy with that fine I don't need anyone else to tell me what that is that's up for me to def- define and it is powerful it does take a huge amount of distress off like it obviously it is nice to get that validation from other people but the more you can move towards your own metrics of define which only comes from knowing who you really are and who you want to be and how you want to live and your values and your own integrity when you act in line with that it it just makes life a lot easier as opposed to always looking for someone to externally validate what you're capable of um I've kind of segued a bit there. Does that kind of make sense? It does. It does, and it's it's fascinating because that that is the question I that that's my guiding principle really is when I turn up to the start line or get to the finish line of something, whether it's in the time that I hope for, or in the capacity that I hope for, or with the color of t-shirts that I hope for, and some specific races that will make sense to some and not others. But that's the question I ask: is did you do everything you could to get to this point? And even if I believe I've done everything I could and didn't get the result I wanted. Well, lessons learned. How do you go about it next time? And I think that that frees you in a way because it stops you from stressing about things that wouldn't have changed anyway. Because if you've done all you could, then well done. You did, you did what you could within the parameters and, and you've, got, you've got nothing to be disappointed about because you've given your all. And you, you, can't, you can't work within parameters that don't exist or you would like to have hypothetically. Michael Phelps is a great swimmer because he has an enormous wingspan as well as having spent probably years total in the pool at this point. But if you've got little T-Rex arms, you're probably not going to be Michael Phelps. You can't be disappointed when you don't win an Olympic gold medal in swimming. It's, it's, it's reframing things like this. And it's why when I get asked on YouTube or Instagram, I'll have conversations with people that are, oh, do you have any ambitions to qualify for... Kona or would you do this race and try and do it in this time or something it's like well that doesn't feel that exciting to me I'm kind of drawn to adventure I'm drawn to self-discovery I'm not really that fussed about where I come out of 300 or whether it's under this time or that time yes I've played around with numbers and yes I enjoy being a bit creative with those sort of things in, in previous times but I think taking taking the ego detaching it and then looking at things for what they are has been a very freeing process for me and I'm fortunate I've found it by accident. So I think you you explaining that through your experiences and obviously through what you'll you'll teach through the um, TNE means that people can come to this realization of their own accord through many different ways in their own life. And with that in mind, it's a case of asking how can how can people be more present day to day? I know you've mentioned journaling. I know I've mentioned ice baths. I know you've given some strategies, but being present for yourself is quite challenging because life's very busy there's a lot of external stresses are there any tactics or any methods that you use to help others be more present in their day-to-day lives ask themselves better questions look at things for what they are and to to carry them forward to finding that that freedom that comes from asking the question have i done everything that i could to get to this point if the answer is yes you're a roaring success fireworks in your own head fantastic well done it's um I highly recommend for anyone. I'm sure. I see. I'm going to assume this. Have you seen the uh, Netflix series, The Last Dance, the uh, Chicago yep. Bulls yep. documentary? Yeah. So for anyone who hasn't watched it, I highly recommend it. Even from, I mean, it's just I. I don't watch basketball. I'm not a big, to be honest, watching sport kind of guy anyway. But that documentary was fascinating, um, and the, as a mindset piece as well. Like Michael Jordan, there's one quote that stood out to me. It was, um, I think, a coach talking about Michael Jordan. You know, he's very famous for just practicing free free throws over and over again. And I can't remember the exact quote, but it, it was basically around, um, like, I think it was saying something as in, you know, when the pressure's on, you know, don't you worry about missing that shot. 
And he was like, why would I ever worry about missing a shot before I've taken it? It's completely pointless and it's going to make me perform less. Like, no, I don't worry about it. I just concentrate on the process of taking the shot. And then if it doesn't, if it doesn't hit, well, then I'll learn from it and practice it more going forwards. And it is the common theme you see, you know, that self-validation or those internal metrics that acting in alignment with self and that falling in love with the process is the common theme you'll see amongst people who perform highly and are happy and satisfied in what they're doing. You know, another great example, the Andre Agassi's autobiography is an amazing insight into a kind of the mind of someone who, so he hated tennis, like absolutely detested tennis. He was basically, his dad was, uh, was going to have a kid that was going to be a pro tennis player. It's a bit like the kind of um, Richard Williams and Serena and uh, Venus story. So he tried it with his, his elder, elder kids. They didn't quite make it. Um, and so it was all basically an Andre. And again, he bought a house and so that he could build a full-size tennis court in the back garden. And so that Andre Agassi had this love-hate relationship and that all his self-worth and praise came from playing tennis but he just hated it. Like you just, you read that book and I, I really mean he hated it. He kind of had this real angry, dysfunctional relationship with tennis. Conversely, but he became world champion. Conversely, you know, he married Steffi Graf. Steffi Graf's complete opposite. Again, world champion, but just had a very happy, like love, pure love for the sport, loved the process. And so you can become highly accomplished with either mindset. But one is going to be very negative, draining and stressful. And one is going to be very fulfilling, satisfying and bring you happiness. And it, it comes down to that alignment with self and falling in love with the process. Um, but in answer to your other question, how to be more present. Again, it is simple things like one of the simplest activities or strategies we get people to start implement it comes down to that relationship with the phone like it's so easy for us now to be hijacked in the modern environment we're always being distracted that we're very bad at just sitting with ourselves so a very simple one that people can try whenever you find yourself with just a few minutes so standing in the queue at the shops is a classic example or you know waiting for something what's the first thing everyone does is take their phone out and start scrolling instead of doing that just be present, just concentrate on your breathing, just concentrate on deep, breathing deeply through your nose and just being present, just look around, just take in, just let your, your mind settle. It's a form of meditation in a way. It, you know, we, we think we need to sit cross-legged in a room and do 15 minutes of set practice to meditate. You can meditate anywhere. It's just about sitting with your thoughts, just concentrate on your breath, just let yourself be essentially like in the car or sometimes you're like, don't put the radio on just be just be present in whatever the activity is you're doing you know another great person to listen to on it johnny wilkinson if you listen to any of his podcasts recently he's clearly gone through through a huge amount of self-reflection and introspective work and he, again he's one of those play like world-class professional but it's actually quite a stressful experience for him the entire time he was playing because he put so much pressure on himself to get certain results that it was quite a negative experience and now he talks about you know the quotes I remember is like I can get as much satisfaction from doing the washing up because yep. I'm so present as when I was playing in a world cup final and that will sound quite bizarre to some people and it takes a quite a lot of work to get to that point but you know very simple thing just stop being so distracted just take those small moments each day and just be present with yourself. Just allow yourself to be. Essentially, just allow yourself to be bored is a better way to put it. That's where I found zone two training, specifically without headphones, is a real, real win for me because it's locked in, it's scheduled in every week, and I use it as an opportunity to explore new places, be present with my own pace of breath, the sound of my foot striking the floor or my back disc on my bike, whatever it might be, or the pissing wind and rain as it tends to be up my way but that's what's been very rewarding for me over time to the point where I've tried meditation and actually found it's been serving me in the same way as the zone two so I've decided that meditation isn't something I need to implement 
but that's where I found journaling to be very useful because it's an actual externalization of the thoughts that I have when I'm being present on those zone two excursions, shall we call them. So I think it's, as, as we've said, it's doing the reps to find the opportunities for you to be present and then what do you do with the information that being present gives you. Yeah, that's the um, the same for me whenever I go for morning. If I'm going for a run in the morning, nine times out of ten I won't listen to any music. So again, I'll just be present with my thoughts. And B, if I'm, just, if I'm going for a walk, whether that's morning or in the afternoon with the dog, leave the phone behind and just be for that 20, 30 minutes, whatever it is, just be present. Just take in what's going on. But like, it, It's as simple as that. And it sounds very simple, but many people don't take that time anymore in the day. They're constantly connected from the moment they wake up until they go to bed. And you are paying a price for that. You are basically just hijacking your mind the entire time, which is not... You're not more than anything, you can look at it like this. You're not giving your mind any time to defrag, defrag and process things. And so no wonder you always feel stressed because you're not allowing yourself, allowing that space to to give it that rest and recovery. You know, it's the same as the body. You can't train the body continuously. It needs to recover. It needs downtime. And your mind's no different. A strong message for us to reflect upon as we uh, draw things to a close. So, Simon, thank you very, very much. Enjoyed that. And final question for me is where can people find you uh so the natural edge on social media um so instagram primarily uh websites thenaturaledge.com and simon jeffries on linkedin i post quite a bit on there as well fantastic thank you again and have a good evening thank you very much pleasure being on